So on the last transit, the my children were six and eight, I think. And uh, I have two claims to fame that I'll share with you. One is that I was just uh, the warm-up act for this talk was given by a Nobel Prize winner. <laughs> Must thank me, uh, Madonna. <laughs> the other one, and this is going to be very, very important, I'm going to save you uh, unhappiness for the rest of your life. Do not look at the sun, you want a telescope, and in particular, do not, as I did, hold your child up so he can look through the telescope at the sun. Um, I did not damage my child, but uh, there were a whole bunch of clouds. Not quite as many clouds as we have today. But we were looking through clouds, and I realized all of my attempts to make a solar projection, a very dark filter and all, were totally useless. Because there were so many clouds, I couldn't see the sun through all of it. So I took that off, decided, it looks safe. Don't do that. <laughs> And I'm sure they will remind you of that also. Okay, so I uh, make my living studying the transits of planets around other stars. And they are very useful as a diagnostic of the properties of both those stars and those planets. Um, this is a simulation of a Jupiter passing in front of the Sun. And um, it's a pointer here. So this is the projection of Jupiter in front of the Sun. This would be the Earth projected in front of the Sun. And these are sunspots. So if you do get to see the Sun today, you'll see some sunspots like that. And they're about the size of the Earth. Uh, we have no super-Earths, as they're called, in our solar system. We um, have planets the size of Earth and smaller. And we have planets the size of Neptune and larger, but we have nothing in between in the few Earth size range. And so it is an interesting um, contribution astrophysicists can make to humanity to teach us about these interesting super Earths, much more massive than the Earth, but not so massive that they turn into uh, gas giants. Uh, you've seen a cartoon like this before, I think uh, Anna showed something like that. So if a planet passes in front of a star, the light from the combined system dips. The amount of that dip, this amount here, is determined by the ratio of area of the planet to the star, because the planet's blocking out that much light from the star. And um, for a Jupiter in front of the sun, it's about 1%. And then some of the light passes through the upper atmosphere of the planet. And so we can actually measure the properties of the atmospheres of planets circling other stars by watching just a little bit of light that skims through that planet's atmosphere. And right now, the Hubble Space Telescope is going to make such a measurement about um, Venus passing in front of the sun. So Hubble is orbiting the Earth. And just as you, if we're lucky, get to see Venus in front of the sun, Hubble will do that. And why is it doing that? It's doing that to kind of calibrate what other planets might look like when we study them in front of other stars. Um, when a planet passes in front of the star, we call that a transit. We have a separate word called an eclipse for when the planet passes behind the star on the other side of the orbit. All of these diagnostic characteristics can be measured for planets that transit in front of their star. And even better, not only can they be measured, but we've already been doing this. And this is possible because of the transit. If the planet didn't transit in front of the star, we could only measure a very few of these properties. We could measure the period of the orbit, we can measure the mass of the planet with some uncertainty. We can infer the semi-major axis, the, the distance, excuse me, to the 
children and other people that may not know some of these terms. Um, this is the distance from the planet to the star. Uh, we can also measure how out of round the orbit is, the eccentricity. Again, uh, those properties we can measure with other techniques of studying planets around other stars. But so many more of these are opened up by that wonderful moment when the planet passes in front of the star. Now, many planets don't. In fact, I would say most planets don't pass in front of their stars because the orbits are not aligned. We're not in the plane of the orbit of the um, planet. So most planets we won't see things, but those that do are special because they can teach us more about the planet. Okay, so this was a timeline. This is the transit of 2004. And how many people saw that? Look around you. These are the people you want to go and ask, what was it like? What was it like? Because <laughs> it's going to be bad. Now, we have arranged a charter jet. <laughs> this is us down here. Hubble was launched. Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990. Um, the first hot Jupiter, we call it, was discovered in 1995. Um, the first planetary transit was discovered in 2000. And the reason why it took so long from year to year, five years, was we were discovering a planet or two each year, and the first one wasn't properly aligned. So we didn't see any transits from it. And the second one, also not properly aligned. And the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth. I think it was the tenth one that was found that um, had a transit, had the arrangement so that you could get a transit. Another space telescope called the Spitzer Space Telescope was launched here, and another one called Kepler was launched here. And Kepler is the one I'm going to be telling you most of it about because it's opened up this field of transiting extrasolar planets and more of a And I'll tell you a little bit about a program I like called TESS. It's a follow-up mission to Kepler. Okay, so at this point in the time right here, the number of transiting planets you could count on one hand. And in fact, many of these aren't very useful. This one was, that was the first one found, and this one was. But these reported stars so faint that we really couldn't do much of those diagnostic tests that I mentioned. And then, um, just in the last few years, between the last transitions, just by coincidence, between the last transit and the of this, um, we've discovered a number of more of those planets here, a few dozen, and we've started to discover little ones. This is a, a plot with, I've labeled this one. This is the same plot with mass here, bigger mass over here, bigger radius up that way. And then, look what the Kepler satellite has done. <laughs> done a lot, but here it is. The trick on you. This is actually the period of the orbit, not the mass of the planet. So far, the masses of all these planets indicated by these dots have not been measured. So you may hear the technical term planet Canada. That means we think it's a planet. In fact, we're pretty sure it's a planet, but we're not absolutely sure until we measure its mass. So let me show this diagram again later. Years later. <laughs> Here's a picture of the satellite, Kepler. There's a nice model of this over in the lobby of the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, the measurements from this satellite, and all those points there in red and in blue, the green ones, the green points were made from another satellite that preceded Kepler. It was not quite as capable, it didn't make as many measurements. Um, so let me point out some points here. We got the radius of Earth here, and then the radius of Neptune is that line there, the radius of Jupiter is that line there, and look at all these planets here in between the size of the Earth and the size of Neptune. These are the so-called super-Earths that I was telling you. We have no counterpart in our own solar system. They're very common in other solar systems. And so this is a very, um, Copernican kick in the rear again, saying, you are not special. This solar system is not special. It might be special because we live in it. But otherwise, we keep learning how unspecial it is. Um, these 
points here in blue are multi-plane systems where the Kepler satellite has actually detected not just one plane trace of that star, but more than one plane trace of that star. And now I'm going to really surprise you because the periods of these are measured one day, 10 days, 100 days. Look how many planets have more than one, how many stars have more than one planet inside the orbit of Mercury, which is about 88 days here. We don't have that in our solar system either. It just blows your mind to think, what if there were planets more massive than Earth zinging around the sun every week? Isn't that crazy? In fact, some of them go around the sun, but they're stars in less than a day. So imagine those of you who really like birthdays, the ones that are <laughs> six years old or something, you would have a birthday cake two times a day. <laughs> All right, another mind blow. Reset your ideas about what you thought were the right moment provided to you by the Kepler satellite and some of the uh, measurements teams like my own have made. So Emmanuel Kahn, in 1755, came up with this theory, which is basically right. The clouds of interstellar dust and gas collapse under their own self-gravity. They form a star here that turns on, and then the dust the disk from which they formed is dissipated to the planets are left there. And the planets are all going around the same direction because they form all out of the same spinning disk. And the equator of the star is in the same plane as the plane of the disk and in the same plane as the plane of the planet's orbit. It all makes perfect sense. Unfortunately, it's not true. <laughs> well, not entirely true. Some of it's true. In fact, a good bit of it's true, but there's a, a neat little surprise I'm going to show you. Okay, so one of the ideas was if we had planets here in few day orbits with the size of Jupiter, these were the kind we were able to discover before the Kepler satellite added all this extra stuff. Back up just a couple of slides here. These guys. So when we were starting out here just a few years ago, this is all we knew. And then we had more populated in the same region there. We didn't have all this yet. We were studying these, and we made an interesting discovery that showed that this cannot be the whole story. Because planets are formed, big planets like Jupiter are formed way out, far away from the sun, much further than that. But we were finding them in a few day orbits. And we don't think there's any way to form them. Right? So something had to transfer them from where they were formed to where we observe them. What could that be? Well, one theory was that the planets would spiral in. Now, the rate of spiraling has been greatly exaggerated in this cartoon. It could be more like a million times. Right? But the idea is they would gradually spiral in there. So they formed out here. And they work their way in there and only observe them in these short orbits. But remember, I said, wouldn't it make sense then that the planet's orbit would be in the equatorial plane of the star? But this is where we find that's not true. Um, I, I jumped ahead myself. There's one other thing I need to mention in here. And, it, and it's a cute uh, case where scientists publish things and then they turn out to be wrong, and unfortunately that has to be there in the literature for the rest of the time for people who like me to point them out to So let's just read here. This is an idea, and it's a wonderful idea. I love this idea, but unfortunately, it was wrong. Um, the idea was that as those planets, those big planets, migrated in, they would shepherd the little planets interior to their orbit. And so it was great because it would be like me coming along here with the Pied Piper and saying, come on, all you little planets, I'm going to get you all over here in the corner where it will be easy to count you up and study you from afar. Wouldn't that be nice? 
And we actually have observing programs to try to find these. We never found them because they did not exist. <laughs> um, and, and the evidence is in this plot. The red points are single point nets, and the blue points are multi point nets, and this comes from Kepler. And you see these big Jupiter sized planets in few day orbits are single point nets. Is it six o'clock? No, good. It gets close to six. Let's stop. Go start watching the transit. Um, so they said, well, our prediction will be testable. That's a good thing about a prediction with Kepler and Perot, these satellites. Although these missions will surely focus on finding planetary systems like our own, we suggest that stars with hot Jupiters, those guys, may be a good place to look for extrasolar terrestrial planets. Well, wrong, stop. Those guys are single. The smaller ones do have multi planet systems. But the big ones, instead of shepherding, it's more like I'm a sumo wrestler, and I boom, and I kick the little ones out and throw them either into the star where they disappear or out into the interstellar medium where they also disappear a different way. And more evidence here, an interesting thing, uh, for, for the Hunt story and the migration story I was telling you not to be entirely the whole truth. And what happened here, another interesting story, um, the first transmitting plant was discovered around here, and there's a method of measuring how tilted the star's equatorial point is from the orbital point of the planet, which I'll just explain in a moment with the diagram on the right. But just take my word for it, you can measure that. I'm about to show you how. The first one ever measured, they were aligned. Then everybody said, good. That's exactly what we expected. And the next one was aligned a little bit off, but there was some un uncertainty in any measurement, and it was still consistent with them being aligned. And the next one was aligned. And the next one was aligned, and there are actually two symbols there. Another one was aligned, and another one was aligned. In fact, these are measurements made with some of the world's largest telescopes, and it's very competitive to get your proposal approved on those. And I know the guy who was doing a lot of these measurements, and apparently they were starting to say around here, how many of these do you have to observe before you get it into your thick skull that they're all aligned? You know, at some point, that makes sense to keep measuring the same thing, because it gets boring. Well, then a planet came along called XO3, which my team discovered, and it, uh, it was misaligned. And I remember, even myself, not really believing this, I'm like, really? Misaligned? That much? And the um, managers have their whole bunch of them like that. And what that tells you is that that planetary migration theory can't be the whole story. And in fact, there's another theory that involves planet planet scattering, where you have two massive planets out there, solar system, uh, in the extra solar system, and they interact gravitationally, and that uh, gravity can get chaotic, and they get a close encounter with each other, and one gets swoop, swooped into the interior orbit of that uh, interior of that solar system, and that's how they get transferred in a big zooming, uh, strong gravitational interaction, not a gradual migration. And this misalignment is the evidence for that. So now I'm going to tell you about a little bit of future. That was about things we know of, that measured, say, with the Kepler satellite. This is a smaller satellite designed to find more transient planets around stars that are very bright that will allow us to make even more detailed measurements of them. So it's, a, it's just a PowerPoint thing now. A lot of PowerPoint and a lot of paper, but no real hardware yet. It's uh, part of the process that you propose to do these. And then you get enough money, in this case $200 million, to um, build the satellite and fly it. And then find more things. Uh, it has four little lenses. This is uh, a blow up of it, but the lenses are basically hold your hand size. And this thing is about that big. And it goes out in a very high, long elliptical orbit away from the Earth where it can be stable. It doesn't have the Earth getting in the way of trying to look at the big field of view it's trying to do. 
Uh, George Ricker is the scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology that's the leader of this project in the Space Telescope Science Institute. This is approved for we'll host the data for them. Uh, to compare Kepler to the satellite I just mentioned, Kess, Kepler looks out in a pencil beam over about a 10 degree by 10 degree field of view in the Cygnus constellation. Tests will look over the whole sky and brighter stars, planets passing in front of those brighter stars. This is the number of planets and planet candidates. The planet candidates are in gray, various shades of gray here, and the actual planets that we're sure of because we measured the mass are in color here. And tests will have that. So the difference between now and flying this mission is a lot more planets in this region of this um, diagram where the stars are very bright. So we can make a lot of the ability to measure the characteristics of the planets from the star line. So TESS is complementary to Kepler, not just a repeat of Kepler. It is a broad and shallow survey versus a narrow and deep like Kepler. Uh, TESS will observe much brighter stars, 30 to 100 times brighter, and um, both missions provide a very long, continuous observation. The uh, important scientific questions each mission will answer, Kepler's main question is, how come are true Earth analogs? And we're not quite ready to say exactly what the answer is, but it's basically very common. And that is an interesting thing, because when you were born, or you or you were born, we didn't know the answer to that. It could have been that Earth is very rare. That if you look at other stars, hardly any have solar systems like ours. That could have been the answer, it would be very unlikely. But in fact, almost all stars have solar systems, similar to our own or crazy. <laughs> As I showed you, these ones with Jupiter's orbiting in one day. Now, TESS, what it's going to do is find the nearest star systems that have rocky planets around them, so we can study those planets, maybe to measure the properties of their atmospheres with, say, the James Webb Space Telescope, also going to be operated by the Space Telescope Science Institute next door. Um, I've seen the time. I want to make sure I get to the trends of this, so I'm going to wrap it up here, I think. I just said we can measure the spectra of the planet's atmospheres by making very careful measurements with very large telescopes. So we have to start out with a small telescope first to find it. Then we need to deploy a really big telescope to study the little teeny details in the planet's atmospheres. And then finally, from Jordan View today, we're going to see something like this. This is actually, I just grabbed it off the uh, web. These are sunspots. Uh, poorly displayed, I think, on this. Maybe it's better to run this monitor there. And I'm just hoping that this will happen. Do <laughs> <laughs> sure. we do questions? Or... No. No questions.